Now, what are these chemicals and where do they get, where do we get these from? Uh, as I said, most of the chemicals that were used in the past, uh, in the early generation usage of chemical admixtures or super plasticizers, these were all based on technologies or chemicals that were derived from other processing facilities. For instance, lignin based chemicals, lignosulfonates, okay, where is lignin obtained from? From wood, right? Lignin is obtained from wood and we use wood for processing paper. From paper industries, you get lignin. Lignin itself is not water soluble. So, you have to make it sulfonated to make it water soluble. Okay. So, sodium salts of sulfonated lignin or sometimes even calcium salts could be used as water reducing chemicals. Then you have your typical hydroxy carboxylic acids like citric acid or gluconic acid, which may be found in several of your day to day usage ingredients like sugar for instance or even lime, all of these can also lead to water reduction. Okay. Corn syrup, dextrin, these are all sugar containing compounds and sugar is a very effective water reducer. It also turns out that many of these chemicals are also effective retarders. They also retard the setting of your concrete significantly and the reason for that will become apparent when we start looking at the mechanism of action of these water reducers. Typically, we use about 0.3 to 0.5 percent of these chemicals by weight of cement. So, if you have 100 kilograms of cement, you use 300 to 500 grams of the chemical. So, you can imagine we are using very little quantities to produce the effect that we want, but nevertheless, normal water reducers are only capable of giving you up to about 8 percent water reduction. So, they are not really producing concrete that is either extremely workable or extremely low in terms of its water content. Okay. Now, the problem with excessive usage of this kind of a chemical is that it may lead to excessive retardation and bleeding and also air entrainment. Now, please remember many of these water soluble polymers are like surfactants, like your detergent that you add in water, right? If you mix the water after adding detergent, what happens? You produce air. Same kind of thing can happen with the water reducing chemicals also because they lower the surface tension of the water and it promotes the formation of bubbles. So, if you overdose, okay, just like medical overdose, overdose of chemical admixtures in concrete is not good. I always liken concrete to cooking and admixtures to masalas, right. If you put too much masala, obviously it spoils the taste. You need to have just the right level of masala in your concrete to make it work, okay. Now, high range water reducing chemicals, again, people started obviously first experimenting with the normal water reducers and tried to use them at high dosages, but they soon found out that these were not working. They produce retardation, they produce excessive air entrainment. Obviously, when you entrain air, it leads to drop in strength, right? more air in your system, less strength. Right? So, second generation compounds again came by, uh, uh, came through by accident. As I said, polysulfonates, they were trying to experiment these for dispersing carbon black, right. And these kinds of chemicals again were from alternative industries. So, these poly polysulfonates were initially from leather industry. These are all used in tanning leather. These chemicals are used for tanning leather and that is where they were derived from initially, okay. Then of course, we learned to, uh, to modify the molecule and make it more suitable for usage as a chemical admixture for concrete. So, sulfonated melamine formaldehyde and sulfonated naphthalene formaldehyde came into being as the primary source of water reducers, high range water reducers for a long, long time. In fact, even today, if you, if you look in the market, sulfonated naphthalene formaldehyde is most commonly available in most markets because it is quite inexpensive, relatively inexpensive as compared to your other new generation chemicals that we talk about later. Uh, but even today, you get significantly large number of products which are manufactured with this technology of sulfonated naphthalene formaldehyde. Then we come to the later generation which became quite uh, interesting and popular after the advent of flowable concrete like self-compacting concrete. So, here people started now again polycarboxylates also were from other industries like leather industry also produces polycarboxylate, but now the uh, when, when we start looking at polymer structures, you will see that people could now understand how to manipulate this molecule best to get the most effective performance. So, that is when they started really concentrating a lot more 
on specific additives for the purposes of construction chemicals. Now, generally superplastics are, are, are used at higher dosages, generally, because the kind of water reduction that we demand from these admixtures is much more than we, what we get with conventional water reducers. But if you want the same level of performance, you can obviously work with much lesser dosages of these chemicals, right. But then since we want a performance which is much greater than for what reduces, we have to work with greater dosages. And of course, they are also called super plasticizers as, as a result of their extremely high level of performance. Now, just to give you a little bit more of your favorite subject, organic chemistry, just to uh, lead you through the process of how these chemicals are produced, I am not going to describe these in more detail because even I do not understand these fully. So, I will just talk briefly about lignosulfonates. As I said, you are getting the lignin from the wood. It is basically the waste liquor that is obtained during the paper manufacturing process. Paper is basically you extract the cellulose out of the wood. So, lignin remains and you are leading to neutralization, precipitation, fermentation processes that lead to the ultimate production of your lignosulfonate based chemicals. Polynaphthalene formaldehyde condensates, either melamine formaldehyde or naphthalene formaldehyde. Uh, okay, sorry, you have both separate, of course, the, the process of manufacture is separate. So, uh, naphthalene sulfonates, again, as I said, are obtained from uh, leather industries and so on. So, here the sulfonation leads to a charge on the naphthalene polymer structure, and you subsequently react this with poly, uh, formaldehyde to lead to a polymerization reaction that produces long chains of these naphthalene sulfonates, okay. So, they cannot combine with each other, but when you put formaldehyde inside, you start concatenating the naphthalene sulfonates and forming this long chains of polymers. Often in the last procedure, in the last process of your uh, admixture manufacture, at least the, uh, the older generation admixtures like lignosulfonates or naphthalene formaldehydes, the last step involved neutralization with either sodium hydroxide or lime because many, many a times you produce acidic materials. So, you neutralize with a base to make it more neutral. As a result, most of the salts that you got are sodium salts or calcium salts, okay. Either lignosulfonate or naphthalene sulfonate, you will either get a sodium salt or a calcium salt depending upon the type of base that has been used to do the neutralization. Sulfonated melamine formaldehyde, again uh, this is produced from, from normal resinification of melamine formaldehyde. Again, resinification means polymerization, okay. You have melamine which is made to join together with the help of formaldehyde. Now, the problem with formaldehyde is that it is a hazardous chemical, okay. So, when you polymerize naphthalene or melamine to make these structures, you need to ensure that not too much free formaldehyde is left over in your comp, uh, in your uh, chemical. Otherwise, it would not be allowed for use outside of laboratories, okay. So, all these have to be looked at carefully if you are an admixture manufacturer. I actually did work for an admixture manufacturer for about two and a half years after my masters, where we had to work with these formulations. It was very interesting to see the process of actually production of these polymers the temperature and pH control were critical to get the right level of chain lengths. And we will talk a little later about why these chain lengths are important from the point of view of effectiveness of the polymer. Now, polycarboxylates are a little bit more complicated. They have a free radical mechanism using peroxide initiators and uh, that is what initiates the polymerization which gets, get, gets these vinyl monomers together to make the polymer structure. I will show you the structure briefly. So, make sure that you remember each and every component in the structure because that is the question I am going to ask you on your exam, just kidding. So, <laughs> this is the structure of a lignosulfonate. So, you can see it is fairly complicated, but you can break it down into your sulfonate group which is SO3Na, sodium sulfonate, okay. And this is your lignin part, okay. Your entire lignin structure is described by the organic chain that you see. <clears throat> so, a lignosulfonate is a high molecular weight chemical. So, average molecular weight is about 20,000 to 30,000, okay, moles, uh, sorry, grams per mole, okay. Of course, the way that you do your polymerization will depend 
the uh, will determine the molecular weight. The time, the temperature and the pH will determine the extent to which your chains become longer or shorter. Okay. The one problem with these chemicals is that they may contain significant quantities of sugar. Now, sugar is an ingredient that causes retardation. Of course, it also adds to water reduction, but it can cause significant bit of retardation. Lignosulfonate can on its own also lead to ret ret retardation. Again, we will talk about why the, these chemicals end up in ret retarding uh, concrete, but that is related to the way that these chemicals actually interact with the cement. Okay. So, as I said, lignin is water insoluble, but when you start introducing these sulfonic groups, either calcium sulfonate or sodium sulfonate, you make the lignin soluble or lignosulfonate becomes soluble. And it turns out that sodium lignosulfonate is more soluble than calcium lignosulfonate, which means what? It means that it will increase the effectiveness of the chemical. But the problem there is it is more expensive as compared to calcium lignosulfonate. So, depending upon the processes, availability of raw materials, you may choose one over the other. An interesting thing about this is because sugars are present, these kinds of chemicals also attract bacteria. So, when you store these for a long time in drums and if you notice the drums from outside, many of you who have been on sites and have seen these drums which store admixtures like naphthalene sulfonates or lignosulfonates, you will find after a long period of storage in the heat, these drums start bulging because the bacterial action on these sugars leads to the generation of gas and that gas starts bulging the drums. So, very often in the formulations of these chemicals, we also add what is called a biocide something that can stop the growth of bacteria in the system. So, very interesting to look at the formulation of these chemicals, but anyway, since you are so fond of organic chemistry, I am not going to go further on that. Polynaphthalene sulfonates, again, as I said, the structure involves the naphthalene compound, which is much simpler than that of lignin. And then you have the formaldehyde, which is helping the joining of these things together. Okay. So, formaldehyde basically comes between the naphthalene monomers and ensures that there is condensation happening to form this naphthalene sulfonate. Now, what happens is depending on where your sulfonation happens, at what location. So, here for instance, this is the alpha location in the naphthalene structure, this is the beta location. Depending on where your sulfonation happens, the effectiveness of the admixture also changes. It turns out that when you are naphthalene sulfonate has the beta location where sulfonation actually is happening, it is much better as a water reducer. Now, how do you get that? Obviously, you get that by control of temperatures during the polymerization process. So, it turns out that when you take it to temperatures of more than 150, you make the beta location more stable. Alpha substitution is stable at less than 100. At higher temperatures, the beta substitution is better and that leads to more effective performance of the polymer. So, but again, if you know this, why do not you always produce it like this? Because there is always that balance that you need to give between economy and process and the effectiveness, right? More temperature obviously means more energy has been spent in actually making the molecule, more cost, all that has to be balanced carefully, okay? So, as I said, polycondensation happens with formaldehyde and because you produce an acidic material, you have to neutralize with sodium hydroxide. That is where sulfonate chains or sulfonate groups actually get attached to the naphthalene SO3 Na, right? That is the sodium sulfonate group that gets attached. Okay. Polymelamine sulfonates, again, melamine structure, all these must be setting off some alarm bells in your mind from your organic chemistry lessons. But yes, melamine structure, again, you use formaldehyde, right? and neutralize with sulfonates to actually form this polymelamine sulfonate structure. So, again, as I said, free formaldehyde may be hazardous. So, you have to ensure that your process leads to almost a complete utilization of the formaldehyde. If you look at the material safety data, data sheets that come with chemical admixtures, it will tell you about all the hazardous chemicals that are actually present inside and what quantities they are present to. Okay. So, when you handle these chemicals, obviously, you need to be careful on site. Now, the interest in superplasticizers really picked up after people started using these polycarboxylates and vinyl copolymers. 
So here, as I said, the process is a little bit more complex as compared to your lignosulfonates or naphthalene sulfonates. It involves uh, radical copolymerization. Uh, now, what happens is because of the process and the choice of manufacture of these kinds of molecules, it turns out that many different types of monomers are compatible with the type of reaction. So, because of this, we can actually get polymer chains here which have multiple functionalities. Okay, you can get sulfonates, carboxylates, phosphonates, anionic functional groups, ether, amide and so on and multifunctionality is the greatest contribution of the polycarboxylates or vinyl copolymers. Why are we interested in multi multifunctionality? So, you add one chemical, it leads to water reduction, the same chemical can also help in waterproofing, same chemical may be also helping in shrinkage reduction. Okay, so, that is the kind of functionality we can get from vinyl copolymers which you cannot get from naphthalene sulfonates or lignosulfonates. Okay. So, today the most common term that you hear in the admixture market is PCE, polycarboxylate ethers and that is what is most commonly used today as the super plasticizer, as the go to super plasticizer for producing self compacting concrete and for producing extremely high strength concrete. And today we cannot really live without using PCE for those purposes, although there are examples still of use of SNF, but we do not use SNF as much as PCE today. Now, this polymer structure was developed further to make these comb shaped polymers. So, again you see here there is a main chain and then there are these side chains that come out of this. Okay. So, you can see the structure here of poly uh, uh, carboxylate which is given. You have the main chain and the side chain itself is quite big and quite bulky. Now, when we talk about the mechanism, what you will see is these polymer chains go and wrap themselves around the cement particles and these side chains start projecting out. So, what will happen? The particles of cement will not be able to come together to flocculate, they will not be able to flocculate. So, the side chains being bulky helps in non-flocculation and keeps the workability for a very long time and that is the major benefit of using these large side chain materials. So, the main chain bearing carboxylic groups causes surface adsorption. It helps to wrap the polymer around the cement. The side chain basically leads to repulsion of the cement particles and causes this repulsion to last for a longer period of time. Okay. So, uh, again many of these mechanisms are de described in one more paper by Marshawn and uh, this is again available from uh, I think it was Concrete International, but I will I will anyway have this paper up for you to, to look at in more detail. Now, just to revisit the effect of dispersion in a very simple way, if this is a cement paste that is formed with just water and cement, if you add extra water, you make it more flowable, but you do not add extra water, you just add the super plasticizer, in this case polynaphthalene sulfonate only about 0.1 percent can make it more flowable than adding extra water. Now, polynaphthalene sulfonate is also written as SNF, sulfonated naphthalene formaldehyde. Okay. So, PNS is not always used in India, the more common term is SNF. So, in India you will always hear about SNF or PCE. In most of the cases in construction projects, people will talk about SNF admixture or PCE admixture. Right. So, we will end this first part of chemical admixtures with that. Uh, I also wanted to point out this book, Science and Technology of Chemical Admixtures by Eitzen and Flatt. Uh, this has a lot more detail about the structure of these polymers. It also describes a lot more about uh, how the polymer structures lead to be better effectiveness and so on. Uh, there is also a more basic book on chemical admixtures by Riksam Nailwagan that is uh, quite popular also. There is also a website I have listed here from um, uh, called precast.org. Again, chemical admixtures are described in some degree of detail here, not too much, of course, not like in textbooks, but may be quite useful for you to just go through. 